Good out here, welcome fun out of the war on news. Your weekly sacred cow slaughtering assault on current affairs beam live from the palatial Stratus news bunker buried deep beneath the heart of the Greyland Republic. If this show was the Labour Party leader, Darren Hughes would have been gone by lunchtime. And tonight's political media crimes against reason kill zone, Earth to Labour Party, Earth to Labour Party, danger, danger, flashing red warning lights of impending doom. Forget the mother of all budgets, National unveil the angry, violent dad of all budgets, John Key's electorate chairman to decide funding for political documentaries. I wonder how my application for National Party Rich Pricks We Slavishly Love will be received by New Zealand on air now. Plus this week's Sex in the Super City, Wank of the Week and the Barack Obama People's Year of the Week Award. Leading the war on news this week, brothers and sisters, politics is brutal. Goff crucified for loyalty and principle that still fell far short of what we demand of a Prime Minister, yet John Key has filmed mocking us for his BMW luxury deal at a time when he is crippling the welfare state, and Key gets described by the media as laughing at himself. Fano, he's laughing at how the little shire Volk complain about him buying his luxury BMWs the way a person with $40 million in a Hawaiian mansion laughs at being threatened with a parking ticket. He decided to purchase luxury vehicles in the same week he called on beneficiaries to get less. And he wasn't honest with his answers when questioned on when he knew about the BMW deal after it was revealed his ministers did in fact send letters to each other and Key had signed them off. He's laughing the way the Count laughs when he counts things off with lightning and thunder and an evil sounding organ in the background as bats flap around. <laughs> 34 luxury BMWs. <laughs> Six separate ass massages. <laughs> Four individual air conditioning units. John Key isn't laughing at himself. He's laughing at you. Brothers and sisters, police cheerleader Greg O'Connor has responded to a police shooting in Napier that killed a man by demanding police should have more guns? I'm not sure how giving more guns to police would have stopped the Napier man from being shot dead. What does Greg want here? Cops to have guns in both hands when they confront people? How come every time anyone pokes O'Connor these days, his first bark is always, more guns now? His last more guns now moment was over the shooting of two police officers who entered a home in a random warrantless search based on little else other than I can smell me some marijuana only to be ambushed by the paranoid stoner. In that case O'Connor's more guns now would have only worked if the police had entered the house with guns drawn. Think about that. Do you really want to give undertrained police the powers to conduct random warrantless searches in your house with guns drawn? Only Gaddafi wants police to have those kinds of powers. And while the more guns now mantra is ringing in our ears, here's the case of West Auckland Police Sergeant Martin James Follin, who was accused of bashing five prisoners, one of whom he assaulted so viciously the prisoner had to have his testicle removed. What about him, Greg? Are we giving a gun to West Auckland Police Sergeant Martin James Follin? Does he get a gun too? He does? Oh, he does. Yay, Fano. Do we want cops like West Auckland Police Sergeant Martin James Follin having guns, or do we want those police who are highly trained to deal with the pressure of armed confrontation? having the guns. When it comes to arming all police, I hate to use a Paula Bennettism, but yeah, nah. Brothers and sisters, sensible sentencing trust Grand Wizard and recreational gallows enthusiast Garth McVickers released his memoirs this week, but because he didn't write it, he hasn't read the whole thing yet. It's a case of ghost writer for a zombie reader. Garth's memoirs start when he was just 15 months old. He was playing in the sand pit and some darky kids stole another kid's spade and bucket. Young Garth had to be held down by four kindergarten teachers to stop him from stringing the thief up from the swings on the playground. Garth 
touches upon important moments in New Zealand history. His abusive police who didn't kick Springbok tour protesters when they'd fallen over, his throwing up on the day the homosexual law reform bill passed, and his dismay at the rise of chicks in Parliament. It's a riveting ramble through the angry, misinformed mind of 1950s white New Zealand, so it's exactly like listening to News Talk ZB. To the headlines, final. Earth to Labour Party, danger, danger, flashing red warning lights of impending doom. You know when Chris Carter starts making sense that something terribly, terribly wrong has happened. Is it just me or does it seem a tad optimistic that the Labour leadership seem to think that an 18 year old running naked from a former minister's home he shares with a deputy leader at 2am in the morning wasn't going to be newsworthy enough to get out to the media? What kind of headlines were Phil Goff and Annette King banking on to remove the public's gaze? Alien invasion? The second coming? OJ Simpson breaking out of prison live, being chased in the car with a gun to his own head, ringing into Pierce Morgan to confess he'd killed lots of white women. Regardless of whether Darren is guilty or not, the massive lapse in judgement of having an 18 year old at your home at 2am in the morning after a boozy night on the town is enough to have been stepped down immediately. To allow this farce to continue under the presumption of innocence is not what mates do. Mates go, <coughs> Mate, that's some pretty heavy sexual allegation shit right there. You'll be standing down immediately and I will be making a statement right after you stand down. That's what mates do. They hurry their mates into making the honourable and righteous decision when allegations are this serious. Mates don't stay stum. This is the Labour Party, not the Catholic Church. Who knows if Darren was trying to personally extend his slim majority. What consenting adults in the privacy of their homes do ain't my business. But the fact he put himself into that position at all suggests his step down should have been a foregone conclusion rather than a timing issue through the media that Andrew Little didn't know beforehand is staggering. The frustration is that right when the government are most vulnerable, when the reality of their disorganisation in Christchurch is starting to become apparent, when their zero budget is being announced, when their crippling of the welfare state will go ahead, when the lives of the 43% who earn less than $45,000 per year are about to become increasingly more difficult, we have a political opposition in total disarray. And now we have Judith Tizard telling everyone it will take her a week to decide if she'll come back just to stick it to those who don't want her back. Angel Little has told her and the next couple of bozos to stand aside for the incredibly talented and underrated Louisa Wall. Yet Tizard is playing the exact same pain in the ass bullshit that made her so annoying in the first place. What's the difference between the Labour Party and the Fukushima nuclear reactor, the Fukushima nuclear reactor knew when to stop melting down. Is the leadership of Phil Goff now being questioned? If it isn't, Labour are officially the most stoned caucus in the history of the Westminster system. The dilemma is who to replace him with. Labour have a leadership crisis as in no one wants the leadership. The only silver lining for Labour is that by November, the reality of privatisation and the demolition of public services will have left the promising career and demise of Mr Hughes as fish and chip wrapper fodder, and the public will be feeling the full bite of the recession. If Labour have finished self-mutilating themselves, can we get back to the issues, please? Moving on with the headlines, Fano. The National Party aren't even bothering to lie to us anymore about their wet dreams to slash public services by hiding the cuts behind the quake. Now they just let Labour's supernova implosion distract the media attention while they tell us all in passing that they intend to axe all services they deem non-essential. Do you really want the laughing clown and Bill English deciding what is and isn't an essential service? Doesn't Bill English strike you as the sort of devout Catholic family man who self-flagellates? Do you really want a masochist deciding what is non-essential any more than we want Jerry Brownlee with the Hulk hands to be left in charge of rebuilding Christchurch? 
seeing as Keith thinks people wouldn't die if he cut off their welfare and that the poor who need food parcels have themselves to blame, isn't leaving the access of dribble in charge of pruning public services a little like Darren Hughes hosting a blue night disco? How can we, in the face of the worst recession since 1929, look to start cutting public services when the public desperately need those services? It's those public services which saved lives in Christchurch. It's those public services that keep communities together. It's those public services that lower the cost of living and promotes a standard of living that every New Zealander has a right to expect in this country. National had $1.7 billion to bail out Mr Magoo at South Canterbury Finance. National had $34 million for private schools. National had $15 million for the manufactured crisis of The Hobbit while borrowing $120 million per week for tax cuts. If we are looking for things to cut, how about the $875 million on new frigate missiles? How about less luxury BMWs? How about those wealthy and those who have done well from the corporate tax breaks pay some of it back. What is it and why is it that the weakest and most vulnerable in New Zealand have to pay all the time? <laughs> Moving on with the headlines, Farno. The Prime Minister's electorate chairman, Stephen McElroy, has been appointed to the New Zealand On Air board to decide who gets funding for political documentaries about health, education, welfare and law and order. I wonder how my application for National Party Rich Pricks We Slavishly Love will be received by New Zealand On Air now. Brothers and sisters, isn't allowing John Key's electorate chairman to decide what political documentaries get funding a bit Orwellian? What documentaries do you think will come out of that board now? Great things John Key has done for health? Gosh, John Key is handling corrections well. Why teachers are wrong and John Key is right. We need political documentaries that challenge policy, not parrot them. Allowing John Key's electorate chairman to decide the funding for documentaries isn't New Zealand on air. That's more like Libya on air. This isn't public broadcasting. It's political propaganda. Fano, are you feeling sexy? It's sex in the service any time. Brothers and sisters, Paula Bennett got angry this week at a minute taker who suggested that after she spat in the face of the mayor's task force on jobs, that the meeting got tense. Apparently writing bitch and underlining it as a minute wasn't a fair representation of the meeting. Paula told the mayor's task force on jobs that they were simply a lobby group for pet projects and the minute taker noted the anger this comment caused the mayors. But Paula says that's a lie and not all the mayors his lover. Yeah, nah. Paula Bennett getting shitty at minute takers noting the disgust the mayor's task force felt for her is a little like KFC getting shitty at anti-obesity campaigners showing their disgust for the Double Down Burger. In fact, Paula Bennett and the Double Down Burger have a lot in common. They're both bad for beneficiaries, won't improve their well-being and will eventually both lead to early preventable deaths. The only difference between a Double Down Burger and Paula Bennett is that I can throw up a Double Down Burger. Finally, let's hand out this week's Wanko of the Week Award. Brothers and sisters, this week's Wanko of the Week has to go to us, New Zealand. Now, I realise and appreciate that every time the words fall shore and seabed get mentioned, you automatically fall asleep. Who knows what it all means other than Maori's getting angry again, right? The only time European New Zealanders wake up in this debate is when ACT creeps into the room and whispers into our ear, Dear Maori's want to steal our beaches. Then it's all, oh, oh the beaches everyone, stop stealing my ill-defined vision of a New Zealand beach, blah, 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 blah. The Marine Wildlife Frolicking and Beach Liberty Bill represents, however, one of the largest land confiscations in New Zealand history. Remember all those old confiscations? The ones from the 1800s when our forefathers stole land Māori weren't prepared to sell to them and we shat all over the Treaty of Waitangi. Remember those? Remember how Māori haven't forgotten any of them and that they have slowly and painfully worked their way through the legal system? Yeah, well, all National have done with this marine wildlife frolicking and beach liberty bill is doom our grandchildren to the very same shit we've spent over a century trying to rectify. 
European New Zealanders, let me right now explain why Māori are pissed off in a way you'll understand. Gather your children, bring in the neighbours, call mum and dad in that cheap retirement village you've left them to rot in. This will be the one moment in television that anyone takes the time to explain the foreshore and seabed issue to you in a way you'll finally understand. Then you'll get why so many Māori are righteously fucked off. <coughs> you own your house, right? Whether you've paid it off completely or you're paying your mortgage, you own it. Imagine the government walked up one day and said to you, Hey, you know, you know how you think you own your house? Well, we're passing a law that will take it off you. But don't worry, if you think you've got some claim to your house, we're going to let you go to court to argue your case. Isn't that magnanimous of us? How many European New Zealanders would accept that prospect of defining your precious property rights in such a manner? Seeing as most European New Zealanders go into some type of rage at the mere concept of being told what tree they can or can't chop down on their own property, how many would put up with the government passing law to remove their rights altogether but allow you to go to court as a means of redress? None. Not one European New Zealander would put up with that, yet that is exactly what the government have told Māori to put up with. The salt in the wound being that to extinguish any customary right, all the Crown has to show is that a white person touched the land Māori are claiming at some time since 1840. It is outrageous. It is racist. It is a breach of the spirit of the law and it is a breach of human rights. It's land confiscation. And while it bores the nuts off most European New Zealanders, let me make this clear to your apathy right now. All we are sowing are the seeds of division that our grandchildren will have to harvest. You will be asked what you did and you will answer that you weren't really aware of any of it because you kept changing channels to watch Deal or No Deal. And to use a cultural reference, you might understand. The majority of Māori are saying, No Deal! Let's end the show by handing out this week's Break Obama People's Here of the Week Award. Brothers and sisters, this week's Barack Obama People's Hero of the Week Award has to go to week two of our not really a war war in Libya. Does anyone even know what the West are doing there this week? We've flattened most of Libya. It's cost around half a billion dollars so far. And Syria, Bahrain and Yemen continue to kill their pro-democracy protesters without any threat of a no-fly zone being imposed whatsoever. Europe gets lots of its oil from Libya. Did the UN bomb because of oil? That's it for tonight, folks. Don't forget Citizen A plays Friday, 7.30 p.m. Freeview 21 on Sky 89. Follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter account and Citizen Bomber Facebook site. It has all the shows posted up online and allows you to befriend other like-minded citizens for romantic news moments. Good night, New Zealand. You stay classy, Otero. Right, right.